Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our audio podcast of Coffee with Sister Vasa. I'm Sister Vasa, and I'm sitting here with my coffee in the beautiful capital city of Austria, that is Vienna, and Juliet is with me, our sound producer at the moment, who is about to say hi to you. Hello, everyone. As a surprise, everybody, for our Patreon subscribers, today I am beginning a series of audio podcasts, which I'll be weaving into our usual audio podcasts here on Patreon, on the topic of the Church Fathers. Yay! Uh, The thing is that one of you Patreon subscribers quite a while ago asked for this topic to be introduced. So I thought, why not? We will do this topic. And for those of you not interested in it, don't worry, we will be proceeding with our usual programming here on Patreon. But every few, I don't know, we'll see how often we'll do this. Uh, But we will proceed every week or two, perhaps every two weeks, with the topic of patrology. And I will be explaining in this podcast what that is. Now, if you are listening to this on YouTube, not as a subscriber to Patreon, that means we decided to make it available on YouTube so that you could consider, if you're a YouTube listener, uh, consider subscribing to these audio podcasts on patreon.com. If you go to patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash sister vasa, you will find our page on Patreon and you can become a happy subscriber and a well-informed subscriber, my friends. So think about it or better yet, don't think about it and hashtag just do it. All right. So on with our invigorating new topic. We are talking about, my friends, about the quote-unquote church fathers, the ecclesiastici pateres, a term that was first used by Eusebius of Nicomedia in his work Contra Marcellum. That's just a fun fact. These church fathers are also called simply the fathers. That would be the earliest designation of this category of people, I will be explaining who we mean by this. Or they're also called the Holy Fathers, as we most often say, for example, in Russian usage, we say Svetlye Atsy. And the patristic tradition in Russian, we call it Sviato Otecheskoye Pridanye. Anyway, who are the Church Fathers? And why are they important and still so relevant in Orthodox Christianity? You're all asking out there. The fathers are, most simply put, my friends, most simply put, witnesses to Christian faith in the past by their lives and works. Witnesses whose witness has been received by the church as her own, as reflecting the church's own voice or way of seeing or thinking, the church's own vision which is called in Greek her phronima. As witnesses, everybody, as witnesses, that is martyres in Greek, the word martyres in Greek means witnesses, as witnesses to faith in Christ, the fathers carried on the vocation, one could say, of the holy apostles, whom Christ called, if you remember, whom Christ called to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and beyond it, as it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We study not only the works, but also the life stories of the fathers in the branch of theology or the theological discipline called patrology, or sometimes patristics. We'll get to those terms. We study also their lives, everybody, because Christianity is not an abstract philosophical system, but a lived experience of a human being's personal relationship. Don't get shocked, I'm using, yes, personal relationship with Christ. 
I'm using this expression, personal relationship with Christ, not so that some of you freak out about, oh, is this Protestant lingo? No. I'm getting to the point, because, you know, to say personal relationship is not Protestant in and of itself. Uh, it happens to be a thing, right? And words are words, but things are things, as one of my mentors used to say. So Christianity not being an abstract philosophy, but a lived experience, is something that is passed on by something called tradition. Tradition being, of course, from the word verb tradere, meaning to pass on or to deliver. So Christianity is passed on, and faith and life in Christ is passed on from one human being to another in this world, and from one generation to the next. So it's a personal thing, in other words. Beginning with the first eyewitnesses to Christ, the holy apostles, faith and communion, or kinonia, with Christ is passed on by human witness, as St. John the Evangelist writes in his first epistle, in the very first chapter. As St. John says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. All right, these eyewitnesses, the apostles, St. John speaks for them when he says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have kinonian, or fellowship or communion with us. And our communion, or our fellowship, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. So the point I'm making here with this quote, everybody, is just as the apostles are writing this as St. John witnesses, they are writing this so that we might have communion with them and that their joy may be complete because our fellowship, fellowship is in joy the kind of joy that comes in the Holy Spirit. This is a common purpose of Christian witness, all right? And it is uh, the central thing to keep in mind about the apostolic vocation of the Holy Fathers. And let me now throw in the fun fact that the term patrology or patrologia in Latin, because it actually comes from a Latin source. The term patrology was introduced, interestingly, by a Lutheran theologian. That's ironic, I suppose, on several levels, but it was introduced by a Lutheran theologian as far as the term goes, patrologia. The theologian's name, the Lutheran theologian's name was Johannes Gerhard, who died in 1637, if you wanted to really know that. This Lutheran theologian, Johannes Gerhard, introduced this uh, term in his work, in the title of his work. This was the title of the work, Patrologia Sive de Primitive Ecclesiae Christiane Doctorum Vita ac Lucubrationibus. So, Anyway, I should mention that came out after his death in 1653 in Vienna. But what the title does tell us is that patrology, from the very outset, looks into the teaching and not only the teaching, but the lives of the fathers. In patrology, we look into the teaching of the fathers in their written works in connection with each father's life and person for the reasons I explained above, because Christianity is personal, as is its tradition. It is passed on from person to person. Please note, as well, that patrology also includes the study of ancient Christian literature in general. For example, apocryphal texts, and texts the author of which is unknown, like the Didache, 
or Vida Hi, an ancient Christian catechesis of the late 1st century or the beginning of the 2nd, which was only discovered not that long ago in 1875, but we will have a separate audio podcast on that source, everybody. But Patrology also includes sources like that one of ancient Christian literature. It also includes the study of the writings of heretical teachers. So it's not only the writings of the fathers that come into play here when one studies patrology. Why does one study also the writings, those that are extant or indirectly witnessed to, the writings of heretical teachers? Because, everybody, hang in there. If this is boring for you, but you've decided that you need to know this, um, hang in there. We also study the writings of heretical teachers because the fathers were often motivated to write their works for polemical reasons, or more specifically, as a response to those who opposed the faith and dogma of the church. And we'll be talking more about what heresy is, that word heresy, and also what dogma is. So those two terms, quite distasteful, probably, to postmodern culture, dogma and heresy. We will be talking about those terms and contemplating them and uh, discussing their history as we continue with this little series of podcasts. So come back and listen to the rest of them, all right? And subscribe on Patreon if you haven't done so yet. Moving on, throughout the history of this subject that we have called patrology, two other terms crystallized, one term being patristics and the other ancient Christian literature, or in the German-speaking academic world, altchristliche uh, li, uh, one second, Literaturgeschichte. All right. The first one, um, the the first term, patristics, in case you were wondering, comes from the Latin theologia patristica, which means patristic theology, and it has been used since the 17th century by academic theologians to differentiate the theology of the fathers from other branches of theology or theologia. So other branches like biblica, scholastica, symbolica, and speculativa. So patristics comes from this uh, term that, uh, that uh, describes theology uh, in Latin, and it is patristica. Okay? It's an, ad- it's an adjective. The other term, ancient Christian literature, which originates, excuse me, if you hear the turning of pages in our high-tech studio, that is something that one can hear, because we like it that way for this podcast to be action-packed for your enjoyment. The other term, ancient Christian literature, which originates at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, stands for actually a non-theological, but rather philological discipline, okay? It studies the works of the fathers as part of the general history of literature. But let's get back to patrology, my friends. As part of this little introduction to the subject, I should mention to you the important term consensus patrum, which simply means consensus of the fathers or general agreement amongst the fathers on a certain question of the faith. Now, this consensus patrum, which is sort of a terminus technicus for this uh, criterion, since the 4th century, the church began to accept this consensus patrum as an important criterion for establishing or formulating orthodox teaching. One can see this criterion in play, for example, in St. Basil the Great's work on the Holy Spirit, the Spiritus Sancto, 
in chapter 29 of that famous work, where St. Basil refers to the witness of a whole row of church fathers. And centuries, centuries later, to name another well-known example, St. John of Damascus, in his first oration on the holy icons, towards the end of that first oration, considers it decisive, as far as the orthodoxy of venerating holy icons goes, the fact that this was a custom from the fathers. Iec pateron sinifia. Let's get to another question now. That's on everybody's minds, no doubt. Does the Orthodox Church have official criteria, say a list of criteria, according to which we say who is a church father and who is not? Is there such official criteria like a list? No. The Roman Catholic Church does have four criteria, listed first in 1563, now, I'm just going to mention this, that the fact that the Roman Catholic Church does have specific criteria that have to be met by a certain Christian writer in order for him to be considered a church father. Should I mention that he has to be a man? <laughs> you can't be a father as a woman, can you? Um, that's not one of the criteria, however. So the Roman Catholic Church has these four criteria that one learns, if you learn this subject, say in a theological academy, uh, one would learn about these criteria uh, that are, I think, acceptable also for the Orthodox. However, this is not set in stone, okay? Um, but anyway, in 1563, these four criteria, which I will now, don't despair, I will tell you what they are, they were in 1563 listed by Melchior Canor in his work De Locis Theologicis. And here are these four criteria. Number one, Doctrina Orthodoxa, which obviously means Orthodox doctrine, that the Father had, you know, sound teaching. Number two was Sanctitas Vitae, or holiness of life, that the Father was holy, that there's no, you know, dirt on the guy. Number three, approbatio ecclesiae, or the approbation of the church, and number four, antiquitas, or antiquity. So there's long enough time has passed. It's not someone that died the day before yesterday. And before I finish, let me mention as part of this general introduction to patrology that a very important collection, a very famous collection of the works of the fathers is the Patrologia Greca of Jacques Paul Mine. This is 161 volumes, 161 volumes that originally came out uh, in Paris, uh, published by Jacques Paul Mine, almost all of them. And if you ever see as a reference to a quote by a father that says capital P and capital G, this is a reference to the Patrologia Greca of Jacques Paul Min. Now, Jacques Paul Min, Min, who died in 1875, was from a came from a French um, merchant's family, and he studied um, at the uh, Collegium, the Theological Collegium in Orléans, and he was later a teacher there. Then he was ordained priest in 1824. I'm just throwing at you a few fun facts about Mine, M-I-G-N-E, by the way. He did open a big publishing house in Paris in 1836, in case you didn't know fun facts about Mine. In fact, he had about 600 employees, so he was a talented uh, businessman, I suppose, and Mean published, published many theological works, but the best known by far is his Patrologia, uh, Patrologia Latina and also the Patrologia Greca, and to this day, uh, this is an important, uh, you know, 
important, uh, these are important collections that are consulted uh, both by theologians and church historians. Now, it was between the years 1857 and 1866 that the 161 volumes uh, were, that, that, that they came out in this big publishing house in Paris of Min. And what else can I tell you? That this is uh, this huge collection is in all, of course, libraries that are relevant to uh, church historians and theologians. The very first author uh, in um, the church author in this collection is uh, Clement of Rome who died in the year 103. And the very last author in the PG is Gennadius of Constantinople, who died shortly after 1472. So it spans from the beginning of the second century all the way to the latter 15th century. Okay, so that's enough for today. Uh, I think you should look forward to if you're interested in this topic, it will be more fun as we pass as we pass this ground uh, laying or or the foundation for the rest of the course. So we'll have another audio podcast that is going to be the second part of the introduction, and eventually we will move on to the very interesting part of the sources and the lives of the fathers. And we will be going through the Didahi, that catechetical work, also very important for the history of liturgy. We will go through the ap apostolic fathers, at least the main names, and the apologists amongst them, the pre-Nicene fathers first, right? And then we will be getting to the era of the great councils, the history of the Great Councils is, of course, very relevant to the lives of most of the fathers. Okay, everybody, so that's enough for today. Do subscribe on patreon.com slash sistervasa if you're not sus subscribed yet. And join us as we go on this journey through church history along the lines of the church's most famous voices. And we will be covering some of the fathers of the West that are relevant to Orthodox theology of the East. Okay, so tune in, don't miss it, hashtag just do it. Juliet's about to say bye to you people. Bye everyone. And thank you for your support to those of you who are already subscribed. I'm saying goodbye. I'm Sister Vasa. This has been Coffee with Sister Vasa, a habit you do support or that you can support if you don't yet. Mm -hmm.